please stay till the end of the video for a special announcement. Ten thousand subscribers. I am at a complete loss for words, except for three very important ones. I love you, all of you. Thank you so much for making something I dreamt of but never thought would ever happen happen. And it's thanks to all of your love and support that I've been able to do so much with this channel, making it bigger and better than I ever thought it would be, and just being able to do what I love doing. I mean, I was overjoyed when I reached 500 subscribers, and now I've reached this many, and in just under a year. Let that sink in for a moment. Obviously, I was going to celebrate this occasion, but this time I let all of you decide on what video I should make. And while well, the votes have been counted and the people have spoken, it was close, but it seems top 10 underrated Fire Emblem units was the victor. Now in every Fire Emblem game, you've got a huge cast of characters to choose from, to use as units in battle, as well as getting to know who they are and everyone has different views and opinions on each character based on experience, personal bias and other factors. While I feel no character in Fire Emblem gets completely ignored, I feel there are some characters that don't get nearly as much attention as others, and to be honest, I don't know why. I mean granted, not everyone is going to like or heck even bother using every character, but I feel certain characters aren't given enough love and attention compared to others, which is why we're here today. So join me my fellow subscribers, all 10,000 of you, as I celebrate probably my greatest milestone yet by counting down my top 10 underrated Fire Emblem units, as requested by you. Before we begin, there are a few things I need to make clear. First of all, this is just my opinion, I am ranking each of these characters based on how underrated I feel they are, not on how good I think the characters are. Speaking of which, my second point is that when I say underrated, I mean units that I feel don't get enough attention despite being genuinely solid units since I find the majority of these characters to be all around good units regardless of preference, and personally I think they're good characters as well, though most of them aren't great if I'm being perfectly honest. Third, is that some of the characters on here I have talked about in previous videos, but I'm looking at them more in terms of why I feel they're underrated this time. Fourth is that I'm only looking at playable units, not NPCs, amiibo characters or bosses, and I'm looking at all the units from the Western Fire Emblem games and Fire Emblem Binding Blade. And finally, if you're wondering about the other 9 candidates for the 10,000 subscribers special that didn't win, don't worry, each of them will be made into a video at some point. And with all that cleared up, let us embark on our biggest adventure yet, as we celebrate a gathering of 10,000 voices in order to acknowledge those whose voices go unheard in the world of Fire Emblem. Style. Because of the role Cavaliers play in Fire Emblem, unless they have a very out there personality like Kirin, or end up being a complete powerhouse and all around legend like Sane, it's easy to overlook most of them. This is a shame because I feel there are a lot of good Cavaliers that get overlooked, and Style is probably the most overlooked of the bunch. I guess when it comes to mounted units in Awakening, all eyes are on Frederick. Until the second half of the game. Style is a member of the Shepherds and first appears in Chapter 2 of Awakening, and Style is a typical Able Cavalier series trope. Style is a very kind person who gets along with everyone and is extremely dedicated to what he does, as well as being able to read people and know exactly what to say to them, making him very approachable and easy to talk to. Though despite all his efforts, Style and many others see him as incredibly average and not much of a standout character, as well as being a bit of a scatterbrain, I think I understand now why people tend to forget about him. Though Style can be somewhat forgettable, I find him rather endearing since him being a scatterbrain allows for quite a few funny moments even if they aren't intentional, and Style has pretty good support conversations that often aren't too deep, but they're enjoyable nonetheless. Plus, like Ileana and Effie, Style is a huge glutton that eats more than anyone in the army. I reckon it's because of these three that Nora is starving for resources. In terms of combat performance, much like the typical able type Cavalier, Style is generally well-rounded starting out, though his growth rates tend to excel in attack, defense, and HP. I mean, Jesus, 95%? Unlike Sully, who has better speed and skill in comparison. For the first third of the game, Star will be a pretty good unit and someone you really can't go wrong with, and once he promotes, Star will become much better, depending on who he's fighting. This is because Star has very low resistance stats, making him weak to mages, which in Awakening is not a weakness you want to have, 
As such, making Starla Paladin makes him much more well-rounded and reliable, but at the same time, making him a great knight while leaving him weak to mages until he learns the skill Dual Guard will capitalize on his HP, strength, and defense stats, making him incredibly bulky. Because I'll tell you right now, as a great knight, style is a literal wall against most if not all physical units. Cavaliers can be easily overlooked in Fire Emblem with a few exceptions, but most of them are pretty good units, and style is certainly one of them. While he doesn't stand out too much, style is still a character I like quite a bit, and he can be very effective on the battlefield depending on the situation. You may not be the best style, but you've got it where it counts. Nah. At this point, I feel just about every child unit in Awakening is a fan favorite character. I mean, everyone loves a Wayne and an Ego, Morgan is probably the most broken Fire Emblem unit ever, and both Lauren and Jan have been loved and defended multiple times by fans. Believe me, I know. Na, however, seems to be the one child no one really talks about, not because people don't like her, but rather they seem to forget that she's there, which is sad because I really like Na, and she turned out to be one of the best child units in the game. Though I guess she is rather overshadowed by her over-the-top mother. I think Na and Severa have a lot to talk about. Na is the daughter of Noe and first appears in Paralogue 16 of Awakening. Unlike her mother who is very childish and silly, Na is very serious and stern and acts very mature for her age. Also because of her dragon blood, Na constantly tries to make herself stronger as well as often being rather threatening to others that annoy her. As such, Na isn't the easiest person to talk to, but her supports do reveal her warmer side and allow her to act more childlike despite her stern persona. Speaking of support, Na has some very good ones like with Yarn, where she falls victim for the first time and needs Yarn to help her recover from the experience, as well as her supports with Tiki, where she learns about what monarchies have to deal with and come to terms with what awaits her in the future. So more often than not, Na experiences many hardships and grows as a result of them, making her one of the more interesting Awakening characters. When it comes to combat, much like Noe, Na is generally well-rounded aside from HP and has good defense and speed. Na's stats and growth rates will be heavily influenced by her father, which can affect her overall usefulness, but generally Na is pretty much a better version of Noe, and since I would often pair Noe up with either Donald or Libra, Na often had very good defense. As such, Na works well against most physical units, being able to take the hit and dish them back out, not to mention being able to one-shot a lot of mages. The kids in Awakening have certainly earned a name for themselves, but even so, I feel there are a few kids that get overlooked, because people are too busy being infatuated with a Wayne and an Ego, and Na is certainly one of them. While not as over the top as most Awakening kids, or hell, Awakening characters really, Na is still a strong character and an even strong unit on the battlefield who will eat you alive. It's like I always say, dragons make everything better. Serene. When it comes to Fire Emblem, I'm generally not the biggest fan of pre-promoted units aside from the ones at the start. Personally, I prefer to train my units from the ground up as they often end up being stronger by the end, but that's not to say pre-promoted units don't have their uses, and I certainly do like a number of them. I mean, just look at the Fates Royals, they will fuck you up something fierce. Serene is the last pre-promoted and recruitable character in Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, and is often overlooked because, well, she's the last character in the game, and because of both Vanessa and Tana but I feel Serene's not only strong enough to make it through the rest of the game, but I feel her character is equally as strong. Serene first appears in Chapter 17 of Sacred Stones and is the older sister of Vanessa. Like a lot of Pegasus Knight characters, Serene is often looked up to and admired by her peers, in particular Tana, who sees her as an older sister because of her skill and courage. As such, Serene is a very kind and brave person, but is also rather teasing as shown in her supports with Carl and Gilliam. Despite being looked up to by others, Serene often admires what others do that she cannot, and Serene also has some really good support, in particular with Gilliam, where they discuss their past together and their idea of having a future together. In fact, it made it onto my top 15 Fire Emblem supports video. When it comes to performance, Serene being the last character in the game and being a Falcon Knight can be rather difficult to use because of the enemy's levels and her overall decent but not outstanding stats. As such, it is ill-advised to put Serene at the front of the fight because she probably won't last long, but she can be a very effective support unit for taking out far to reach targets and rescuing allies. Serene's growth rates are overall pretty good, excelling in HP and speed, with 50% growth in resistance and skill to top it off. So given a few levels, Serene can start to hold her own, and considering Sacred Stones is still, in my opinion, the easiest Fire Emblem game in the series, Serene is a unit you could certainly make something out of if you're willing to put the time in. Pre-promoted units often don't make the cut in most of my Fire Emblem teams, but there are certainly units that have what it takes to squeeze their way in, and well, Serene certainly squeezed harder than most. Giggity. Being a unit who, despite her handicaps, can still be very effective, as well as being a strong character in her own right. Nyx. 
Because of conquest structure and overall difficulty, the game encourages you to stick with a select few units and just level the fuck out of them, while pretty much forgetting about the rest. Because of this, people often ignore Mix due to similar units that can be used like Odin, Elise and Camilla. Hey man, she can use Tomes as well! As such, I feel Nyx is a very underused and underappreciated character, even if I will admit using her can be a bit of a hassle at times, but totally worth it. The reason Nyx is difficult to use and often ignored is because aside from being able to use other units that are overall more consistent stat-wise, Nyx's stats make her a bit of a hit or miss unit. Remember how I said Charlotte exemplified the best and worst aspects of the Berserker class? Well, Nyx is very much the same when it comes to Dark Mages, meaning she's very frail, having very poor HP, luck and defense, and considering the type of game Conquest is, Nyx doesn't last long against most units starting out. With that said, if you can get over Nyx's initial hurdle and work around her stat, then she turns out to be very potent, with her very strong speed and magic stats and growth rates, along with her personal skill counter curse, so Nyx is fantastic against other mages and is pretty much a glass cannon. Nyx's character I feel also gets overlooked and ignored due to her lack of use, since her backstory is rather tragic and as such she's rather cold and bitter towards people. However, by supporting with others she opens up to them, along with learning to love and become an overall more optimistic person. Sometimes in Fire Emblem certain units are difficult to use because of the game's difficulty or because of how it's structured. I mean, have you tried to use these units and make them effective? That's a challenge in of itself. Nyx is certainly one of these units, but she's more than worth the effort in the end, as she can be incredibly effective at what she does best, and I find her to be a rather strong and somewhat tragic character due to her backstory, and overall, one of the better Conquest characters. Sigrun and Tanith Much like Serene, Sigrun and Tanith are pre-promoted units that appear about two-thirds into the game, although Sigrun isn't playable in Path of Radiance, and are often forgotten in favour of other flying units, and by other flying units I mean these two, Three of we're looking at Radiant Dawn. While it's easy to ignore them, I feel Sigrun and Tanith can be surprisingly effective if you put enough time in, and they're some of the more prominent secondary characters in the Tellius games in regards to the overall story. I guess Jill wasn't the only one. Sigrun and Tanith first appeared in Path of Radiance and reappear in Radiant Dawn, and are the commander and deputy commander of Benion's Holy Guard respectively. As well as being pretty much Apostle Sarnaki's retainers. You see, Fire Emblem was doing retainers long before Fates made pretty much everyone a retainer. Sigrun and Tanith pretty much act as polar opposites, since Sigrun is known for her kindness, understanding and compassionate nature, whereas Tanith is strict, stern and very fearful. That kind of reminds me of these two. Both of them devote themselves to Sanaki and are pretty much her closest friends, always protecting her, and even after learning the truth about Sanaki, their feelings do not change and their loyalty doesn't waver. Throughout both games they have a decent amount of screen time, and though Tanith is the only one who can support, they both leave an impression on you and show that Benyon isn't just full of a bunch of pompous assholes. When it comes to fighting, Sigrun and Tanith remind me of the whole Cain and Abel archetype, since Sigrun is more focused on speed, whereas Tanith is more about strength and defense. And though both of them don't hold a candle to Marcia, which to be fair is the case concerning most Pegasus Knights when you compare them to Marcia, they can still be pretty good, even if Sigrun isn't playable in Path of Radiance. Tanith in Path of Radiance is pretty solid overall, and has high weapon levels in Swords and the Reinforced skill, making her someone you can definitely use if you don't feel like using Marcia, or just as another Pegasus Knight. In terms of Radiant Dawn, both Sigrun and Tanith arrive rather late into the game and are slightly underleveled, however if you're able to make them both Seraph Knights, they can be really good, especially in Part 4, we have to deal with maps like Chaos Named and Distortions. It seemed pre-promoted Falcon Knights are destined to be overlooked despite being worth using most of the time, and it seems Sigrun and Tanith fall into this category, since both units play a rather significant role in the game's story, and they're strong enough to hold their own, even in a game as relentless as Radiant Dawn. Aaron Poor Aaron. I feel if he were in any other Fire Emblem game, people would have used him more and ended up liking him a lot more. But because of his role in Radiant Dawn and how the game is structured, Aaron is often pushed aside in favour of other Dawn Brigade units, and he really doesn't compare to his alternative option, Nephany. However, if you do decide to use Aaron and level the fuck out of him, he can be one of the best Storm Brigade units and despite the limited screen time, he's a pretty decent character all things considered. Aaron first appears in Chapter 3 of Radiant Dawn as an initial Benion soldier before siding with Dayan after talking to Laura. Because of Radiant Dawn's multiple perspectives narrative and piss poor support conversations, Aaron doesn't get much in the way of character development, much like the entire Dawn Brigade. For what character Aaron does have, He's shown to be a rather simple individual, who seeks to do as much good as possible and is a generally kind person. I feel like I've talked about this before. 
Aaron is also the childhood friend of Laura, and they have some base conversations together to flesh them out slightly. I feel given more screen time, their relationship could have really gone somewhere and been rather sweet, plus we could have possibly got backstory on Aaron's time in Benion and his experience with the people there, but for what we got, Aaron's a cool guy. Much like the majority of the Dawn Brigade, Aaron starts out underleveled and underpowered, but also like the cast of the Dawn Brigade, he could become a very powerful unit if you put enough effort into him, which considering his stats, class and growth rate, is something I feel you should certainly do. Aaron, despite being a soldier, has stats and growth rates similar to a knight or a general, since he's a really good defensive unit, having excellent skill, defense, strength and pretty good HP, allowing him to take the hits and dish them back out. As such, Aaron will pretty much become the Dawn Brigade tank, and if you can make him a halberdier or even a sentinel, then Aaron truly shines, since he could become an absolute wall against most physical units, and from my experience, Aaron completely shits on the goose like nobody's business. With that said, Aaron has two major flaws. His speed and his resistance, also luck. Making it so that Aaron will rarely double enemies, as well as pretty much being decimated by mages. As such, Nephany is the overall better choice, but Aaron shouldn't be overlooked since he can be really useful. The Dawn Brigade members are characters that had lots of potential, but are sadly put to the side because of how Radiant Dawn is structured, and Aaron sadly falls victim to this despite being a character with elements of a sweet romance and one of the bulkiest tanks in the game. I always said Radiant Dawn tried to do way too much at one time. Shesh Shesh is a funny one when it comes to Fire Emblem characters, since I don't hear people saying bad things about her, but I also don't hear people saying good things about her. In fact, I don't hear people saying anything about her. This is a real shame because I think Shesh is one of the stronger non-Child Awakening units, and I really like her character as well. In fact, it kind of upsets me that she's so under the radar as far as Fire Emblem characters go. Well, at least she's not completely forgettable. Shersh first appears in Chapter 12 of Awakening, and is the vassal of Virian. Shersh herself is a very domestic and rather nice person, often acknowledging and appreciating the small things about people, as well as being slightly odd by referring to bugs and monsters of all things as cute. Despite seeming dainty, she's actually really strong, being able to tame her whip in Minerva, and being incredibly close to her. So much so, that she can tell what Minerva is saying. What, she speaks with her now? Man, if that were the case, she could really make Monster Hunter much more interesting. Shash has a lot of really nice supports that aren't too deep, but they often lead to very nice and rather charming interactions with other characters, as well as rather funny ones as she jokingly or seriously threatens people by saying Minerva will eat them. Hey man, if you've got a Wyvern at your disposal, you might as well use it. Shash, as far as gameplay goes, is a very solid unit and one of the more well-rounded Wyvern riders in the Fire Emblem series, and while she won't win any awards, she can still deliver and be very useful, even in a game as unbalanced as Awakening. Shersh's stats are very solid, and her growth rates are just as solid, having a minimum of 50% growth in all stats aside from magic and resistance, which is sadly very low even for a Wyvern Rider. As such, Shersh is a very good physical tank, and can often hold her own against units that don't have a major advantage against her. So most of the time, Shersh can fight a wide variety of units. However, she has a serious problem with mages, which can make her suffer towards the end game, but she's still worth using regardless. I find that with a game like Awakening, the units that tend to be remembered are the ones that either excel in battle or have very out there personalities, sometimes both. While Shersh is a lot more down to earth and overall more balanced, I find her to be one of the stronger characters, and though she's not a top tier with a unit, she still kicks ass regardless. Perry Throughout my time on YouTube, I've been called out for many things. I've been called out for saying dancers were one of the worst classes. I've been called out for saying revelations had some of the best level design. I've been called out for pretty much everything to do with least favourite Monster Hunter monsters, and one of the biggest offences I've committed, aside from barely talking about Sakura, was putting Perry in top 10 Conquest characters. Well, even if I've had an earful about my choice, I still think Perry is one of the better Conquest characters, and I feel that she's a seriously underrated character. In fact, I reckon most people ditch Perry before getting to know and use her properly. Didn't Fire Emblem teach you not to judge people too quickly? Or at the very least, most people? Now, based on what people have said in the comments and other places, Perry is a character most people don't like and actively ignore since she's pretty much a psychopath with a childlike mind, almost like a killer doll, and apparently they feel she doesn't belong in Fire Emblem. Yeah, because we've never had a psychopath in a Fire Emblem team. While I admit Perry is a character I probably shouldn't like, there's just something infatuating about Perry, and she's certainly one of the more standout Fates characters. I feel that people look past the blood first, they may find Perry's childlike demeanour to make her somewhat interesting, or at the very least an entertaining character, and Perry has quite a lot of good supports 
that showed more of her backstory as well as her more lighthearted and innocent side. Plus she's a great cook and makes food that is loved by all. It's the blood that gives it the extra flavour. Since Conquest is one of the harder Fire Emblem games, most of the time you'd want units with great strengths that excel in certain areas like Effie, Charlotte and Keaton. Perry doesn't really have outstanding strengths or at the very least she doesn't before she promotes, well she is a cavalier after all. At first Perry will be kind of average though she does have strong growths in strength, speed and resistance of all things. Once Perry promotes though, then she starts to kick some serious ass, especially as a great knight since she tends to have enough speed to double enemies in this form and has much more bulk in this form allowing her to land stronger attacks and have higher defense. Plus her personal skill Blood First is one of the best in the game. First impressions are a big deal and I reckon Perry doesn't leave a good first impression on most people. But if you get to know her and don't judge her too quickly, which is one of the major concepts of Fire Emblem, you may end up liking Perry more or at the very least not hating her. I can't guarantee everyone will like Perry, but I feel she at least deserves a chance. <laughs> Wendy. No matter the Fire Emblem game, I always go out of my way to have at least one general on my team. Well, they're still my favourite class after all. Depending on the game, this is easier said than done, and in the case of Binding Blade, using generals in that game is not easy since they're rather underwhelming knights from my experience. Wendy is often a unit no one bothers with in Binding Blade because of when she appears in the game and the fact that her base stats aren't doing her any favours. But despite this, I actually found Wendy to be the best of the three knights on my playthroughs and I grew to like her quite a bit despite a rather rocky start. Wendy first appears in Chapter 8 of Binding Blade and is the youngest sister of Bors. Like a lot of knights, Wendy is highly focused on her training and becoming a strong knight. As such, she is very stern and disciplined, often not bothering to take things easy, almost as if training has become her life. Now where have I heard that before? Despite this, other characters will often try to talk to her about less serious matters and get to know her better, which she certainly does appreciate and is willing to open up to them most of the time, but she never forgets that her training comes first. In a sense, she kind of reminds me of Kagero. You know, if Kagero was a knight and looked like Marcia. Don't deny it, the resemblance between the two is uncanny. As a unit, Wendy is actually one of the most difficult units to use in Binding Blade, hell, Fire Emblem in general since she comes in with pretty crap base stats and most of the enemies in the next couple of chapters are axe wielders, so she has a major disadvantage. But like most underpowered units, if you break through the initial storm, Wendy can become pretty damn good. Wendy's stats and growth rates are overall more solid and well rounded compared to both Bors and Bath, having better strength than Bors and better skill and speed than Bath. As a knight, Wendy can't really do much, but once she becomes a general, Wendy gets a lot better since she tends to hold her own against most physical units, which is good considering the last stretch of the game throws many weapons and paladins at you, and thanks to her more well-rounded stats, she is more efficient when it comes to dealing with respawning units and the variety of classes she will be up against, especially when they come at her in hordes. Fire Emblem 6 has a nasty habit of throwing tons of characters at you, a lot of which are very underleveled and are either not worth using or almost impossible to train, thus they are ignored. Wendy is definitely a hard character to train, but I feel she can be a pretty good, though not essential, unit in the game and a cool character in her own right. In fact, I found her to be the best knight of the three. And well, I love my Fire Emblem knights. Well, most of them. Before we get to number one, I'd like to do a few honourable mentions. First up is Maribel. Maribel is a unit a lot of people, including myself, aren't fond of at first because of her attitude. But if you take the time to get to know her, she really grows as a character thanks to her support and I found her to be the best medic in Awakening. Second is Lagar. Blazing Sword has two of the best thieves or assassins in the series, so often people forget Lagar exists, but after using him, he's actually a rather strong unit and he's got some strong supports to go with him, often revolving around the Black Fang. Third is Khalil. Much like Sigrun and Tanith, Khalil is often overshadowed by other Fire Emblem mages, but I feel that if you put the time in, she can be pretty good. While better in Path of Radiance, she can still be useful in Radiant Dawn, especially against the Lagoos, and though her character isn't outstanding, I think she's cool. Fourth is Sumia. At this point it's obvious that I love Sumia to bits and I still think she's a somewhat overlooked character but after making top 10 Awakening characters many of you have expressed how much you love Sumia so I feel she's not so underrated anymore. And finally there's Erika. To this day Erika remains my favourite Fire Emblem Lord and though she's not as good of a unit or as complex as a character as other lords I still find her to be the best. Some claim she's a Mary Sue but personally I don't see it. Anyway with that out of the way on to the number one entry. Isadora. Hands down, the most underrated character in Fire Emblem. While the other characters on this list are often overlooked, rarely any of them are disliked aside from Perry. Not in Isadora's case, 
because based on the feedback from my worst Fire Emblem units video, a lot of you were wondering why Isadora wasn't on the list, and I was wondering why the hell would Isadora be on the list in the first place? Isadora is a character I feel goes criminally underrated, and isn't just a case of being an underrated character, because I find Isadora to be one of my favourite pre-promoted units, and one of my favourite characters from Blazing Sword. In fact, she'd probably make the top 15, but that's a video for another time. Isadora first appears in Chapter 11 of Blazing Sword and joins the team in Chapter 21. Isadora is Queen Eleanor's knight, and as such, Isadora is dedicated to protecting her comrades and improving herself. Isadora is an easily approachable person and is able to talk to just about anyone no problem, eager to learn about them and to learn from them. Most of Isadora's supports focus on her getting to know other members and helping to better herself through them, showing that she is rather open-minded, which is always a plus in my book, and she has a very sweet romance with Harkin, where they are going through a rough time due to Harkin's sudden disappearance and Isadora trying to get over the grief she felt. Gameplay-wise, Isadora is technically the weakest of the four paladins in the game, with Kent and Sane being better in pretty much every way, and Marcus being about just as good as Isadora, but he appears much earlier on. As such, it's easy to overlook Isadora, but for me, Isadora was the right unit I needed at the right time. This is because I tend to only focus on raising one Cavalier, mostly Sane, early on instead of both, in order to have a more varied team. I've gotta make room for Lucius! So having Isadora being a pre-promoted unit, that comes in at a point where you're allowed to use more team members, and she's on par with other units, allows her to fill the role of secondary paladin very well. Isadora being a paladin is a very well-rounded unit, and she has pretty decent stats and roughly average growth rate, though she tends to do well in speed and HP, allowing her to hold her own against the enemy, but not usually dominate them. With that said, Isadora has the benefit of starting with rather high weapon levels, allowing her to use the more exotic weapons, and I've been able to take Isadora into the endgame multiple times, so if you know what you're doing, Isadora can certainly become a strong unit. And there you have it, Isadora is to me the most underrated character in the Fire Emblem series, being a strong character with good supports and a very sweet romance, as well as a unit that despite facing certain handicaps, can be really good if used properly and has her own strengths to boot. She may not be the best, but she can certainly stand on her own two feet, and I found myself liking her a lot more than I thought I would, which is why Isadora takes the number one spot as the most underrated character in the Fire Emblem series. This has been Crash X500. I wish you all a great night, take care, and once again thank you so so much for allowing me to reach 10,000 subscribers. I love all of you who have supported me all this time and shown your love for my videos. Whether you've been around for a week or a year, so here's to you, my radiant subscribers. On that note, I feel now that my channel has grown this much, it's time to step up my game and make a name for myself, and I mean literally make a name for myself, since Crash X500 really doesn't say much about the channel so I feel a change is in order. No, nothing about this channel's content is going to change, so you can rest easy all you Monster Hunter, anime, and fans of other videos I make, but it's clear that Fire Emblem is the heart and soul of this channel. As such, Crash X500 is getting a class change, and from now on I shall be known as Blazing Knight. But if you still want to call me Crash X500, that's perfectly fine. Hey everyone, thank you for watching today's video. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and why not subscribe to my channel in order to keep up to date with when the new videos are coming out. For alternate video recommendations, I first point you to my last video, Top 10 Fates Personal Skills, where I look at my 10 favourite personal skills from Fire Emblem Fates. Next up, I point you to my 1000 subscribers special, Top 10 Fire Emblem Lords, where I look at my favourite lords from the Fire Emblem series. And for something completely different, why not check out Free For All Episode 5, where I pit the anime Sword Art Online and Log Horizon against each other. Hopefully one of those videos will be to your liking. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, and once again thank you all for watching. I'll see you all next time.